Hello, and welcome to the Hobo CEO podcast, where we're talking all things business and entrepreneurship, including the highs and lows, with a sprinkle of neurodiversity for good measure. I'm your host, Shay Wassell, neurodivergent serial entrepreneur, personal and business coach, author, researcher, and most importantly, a mother to one beautiful little human being. This podcast is all about sharing the entrepreneurial journey, as well as tips, tricks, and advice from my guests to help you become the business owner and entrepreneur you've always imagined you could be. And you definitely can be that person. But before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the beautiful lands on which I live and work, the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And I pay my respects to elders past, present, and to all First Nations people that are listening today. So let's get started. Today, I've had the privilege of talking to Dr. Katie Abbott. Katie is a composer, educator, and the founder of The Artist Mentor. Katie is extremely curious about what makes us tick. Her work explores our passions, fears, and motivations using contemporary musical flavors in traditional musical settings, focusing on human connection. Katie's compositions are performed, published, and recorded around the world. She's the founder of The Artist Mentor, where she supports artists across disciplines to build vibrant, long-term, sustainable careers that have meaning and impact. She does this through her six-month virtual residency program. I really hope you enjoy our conversation today about neurodiversity and business and how we manage juggling so many balls in the air. So thanks for listening. I would like to welcome Katie Abbott to the show. Welcome, Katie. Thanks for having me, Shay. It's delightful to be here. So Katie and I met, gosh, a number of years ago through the Women in Business series that we did. And um, recently, as I've transitioned into doing more work um, with women in business coaching, I wanted to start this podcast series to start to have a conversation around how as neurodivergent women or diverse women, we uh, manage and run businesses. And I was really excited that Katie was happy to come and have a chat to us today. So welcome again, Katie. Could you talk to us a little bit about yourself and your business? Oh, sure. I've got a, um, I've got my finger in a few different pies. I, at the moment, I have three different businesses or two businesses and a job, and I'm transitioning just to the two businesses. So all my work activities are related. I'm firstly a composer. I uh, am a musician. I write music uh, in a freelance business capacity, and I have been doing that for 20-odd, 20-plus years I began when I was in my late 20s, so I'm a really late starter to, to music and that's been a really interesting journey just in and of itself and I've got some good stories about uh, about developing that, that musical practice. I'm also a part-time academic at the University of Melbourne in the composition program at the Conservatorium and during COVID, the, I began a business called The Artist's Mentor, and I now support established and mid-career artists across disciplines, so not just musicians, uh, and arts leaders to have joyful and long-term careers that you know are sustainable and can have that impact and meaning that they are sort of craving. Sounds like you're very, very busy with your hat, three hats on at the moment. How do you manage all three? Um, delicately. <laughs> I take, it, it's funny, Shay, because as time has gone by, I've realised that I need a lot of space to myself. And the more space that I build in and give myself that time for processing and absorbing and just, I call it stare at the wall time, the, the easier things become. So the more I try and push, the harder things are. So I, I make sure that I have a lot of space and time to be thinking and then things seem to flow a little bit more easily. Um, it is a juggle with the three and I am reducing my um, my academic load uh, and I'll be finishing up there uh, over the course of 23 um, and taking on a, a slightly different role. There, um, and this is to focus on my composing and mentoring businesses. It's not uncommon for neurodivergent uh, business owners to have multiple hats. 
how do you manage with family and competing priorities and being able to fit that space in, I guess, because having that time to yourself with a busy family life and three areas of work is really challenging. So how do you ensure that you're fitting that time in so that you're able to reflect and have the space needed? It's interesting that you say competing priorities because this is one of the key topics that come up in my programs with artist mentoring. People feel that they have to choose between their competing priorities, but I've learned that you don't. If you've got priorities, they don't have to compete. And what I've found is that uh, it's it's actually a lot of the other in-between things that take up the space. It's the worry and the tension and the the um, not knowing what to say or undervaluing yourself here or there um, that actually take up a lot of the capacity. And I would call it, well, a lot of it comes out in worry, doesn't it, when we sit there lying awake at night worrying. That's what takes up the time. It's not actually the the priorities. So for me, I've learned that that stare at the wall time is the num- first thing to go into the diary. And you can and people say, how do you how do you diarize stare at the wall time? <laughs> and really what I do, um, and I know I need more than most people, but I will instead of planning an eight hour day, I'll plan a six hour day. Because I know that at some point my body is going to just take that. And I'm going to just find myself going, oh, what happened to that last half hour? I've just been staring at the wall. And if I don't get that during the day, I'm going to take it at night when I'm trying to get to sleep and I'm really prioritising sleep because if I don't sleep, then nothing good happens and if everything for me is around sleep. So that means I have to give myself that time or sleep is compromised. So I take on less. I say no to more things and I've got really strong boundaries around what I do and don't say yes and no to. Um. And some, that's really hard. That's been a hard lesson for me to, first of all, be aware that there are boundaries that I do need to put down because I compare myself to other people and go, why can they do all of those things? But I've just, I've learned to accept and own what I can and can't do. And that is much better. So I find that everything's better. There's a couple of things that you touched on that I'd uh, love to talk about. One is sleep, but also when you're talking about what to say yes and no to, what guides you? Because I think as a as a new business or when we're in business, you know, there's all these opportunities to help promote and to broaden our reach and market ourselves. Um, and so sometimes it can feel hard to say no to everything because we want to be out there, we want to be seen and we want to grow our business. So are there some strategies you put in place around boundaries and what you will and you won't do to help conserve some of that energy? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've got um, some pretty clear strategies that I'm, I'm really happy to to share. Because of my composing practice and business has been built over, you know, 20, 25 years, um, I've gone through that, what, what you just described, that doing everything and not saying no to anything um, and then having to learn to say no. Um, and, you know, it's the arts and the arts are underfunded and, the feeling is that when you get offered something, you should, you know, who are you to say no to it? So part of it is, well, probably the core thing that I would say is that I'm very clear about what my core values are as a person. And so then when I, because I've articulated those for myself, I can measure uh, the, whatever it is that I'm trying to decide yes or no to against my core values and also what I'm doing in my businesses and where I'm wanting to go. And if it seems like a good idea, but it doesn't line up to those values, I bite the bullet and say no, even though I might feel compelled to say yes. And in part, it's about being, for me at least, being able to let go of the outcome so, for example, if I'm offered a commission um, to write a piece of music, but that commission doesn't fall into where I'm going right now musically, it's clear to me that I need to say no, but my fear is what makes me want to say yes. And it's a fear of 
well, first of all, yeah, who am I to say no to to, to music commissions because they, uh, you know, they're hard. They're hard to get. They're not an everyday occurrence. But also, well, what if they, what if they give it to somebody else? Or what if they don't ask again? That's that's the real that's the real fear. And so, if I let go of that outcome of well, if they don't ask again, they don't ask again. Um, then I'm I, I'm more able to hold my hold the boundary for myself. And what I've discovered is that people do ask again, and other opportunities. I don't like the word opportunities, but other work that is more aligned comes my way. And so when I leave room for the work that's more aligned to me to arrive, I find that when it does, I can say a big hell yes, because I've created the space to do it rather than feeling really stretched. That feeling of being stretched is so overwhelming for me that I will do almost anything to to avoid it. And I've spent a lot of my life feeling super stretched and at the end of capacity, you know, really full, so that when something really aligned comes along, I'll say yes, but the um, – the best way to describe it it's not enjoyable to do because I can't give it what it needs because I've said yes to other things so having now worked in this way for a number of years I'm finding that work does come it's not a problem the aligned work that I'm doing is deeper more sophisticated has a greater impact and I'm happier You've touched on so many important things there, and I think values is such an important one as business owners. Sometimes it can come across as a bit wishy-washy or what are your values, what are your personal values, your business values. But I think when you're aligning the work that you're doing to those values and you know it's at the core of what you're doing, and I think it's a really important way of explaining to business owners how they can and can't put in boundaries. And I really love that strategy of always coming back to your values or your purpose of why you're doing your business. Mm. Yeah, purpose is really important. Being clear about that I think is helpful. I think it's worth spending the time. And in my artist mentoring programs, we definitely are talking a lot about purpose and values so that they can also make those measures. The other strategy, which I mean, I've never thought of it as a strategy, but consideration, I suppose, is that I'm very aware of what my strengths and limitations are and I think often we say oh go and do something that you're passionate about and what you're really good at but I think it's also good to look at what your limitations are because then we have a holistic boundary and if your limitation is time for example let's just say you've got really young children and you're trying to grow a business and I don't know let's say finish your PhD (laughs) (laughs) or whatever it happens to be and I was in that situation finishing I started my PhD with no children and finished with three including twins and overseas moves and and different things um if your limitation is time then time needs to be considered when you're saying yes and no um and also I think people I notice don't say no because they don't know how to say no they think it's aggressive or or it feels bad or betraying or ungrateful and so when people figure out ways to say no in a way that is genuine and generous then uh it 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 provides a pathway in order to be able to do that but when you don't know how and you just go oh that just feels too hard well of course you're not gonna not just not gonna say that so I've, I've gone through a whole lot of learning because uh, I was the world's worst at all of these things. You've mentioned being stretched, and I think being neurodivergent, um, for me anyway, I can be doing multiple things all the time, and um, sleep is a really important thing for me. That's I was in a workshop the other day, and they said, what is one thing you won't compromise? And I said, sleep, because... I just have to have my sleep. And if I had, if I could have my way, I'd have a nap every day. And my dad thinks it's terrible. He says, you're being lazy. I'm like, you just don't understand. My brain's exhausted. Um, so how do you make sure that you're looking after your mental health, being neurodivergent? And if you could explain your neurodivergence as well, so our listeners can kind of link and understand what we're talking mm-hmm. about. 
Sure. Uh, so I have ADHD. I'm one of those people that have had a recent diagnosis. Um, it was within the last year, so it's coming up to 12 months. And for me, it was an absolute complete surprise. I never, I heard the term ADHD and I, there was nothing in me that associated myself in that way. And now I understand, uh, you know, that I, that I thought that there was a, you know, I was operating on the, on the, on the stereotype of the, the eight-year-old boy bouncing around the classroom. And in fact, my partner's child has ADHD, the, the stereotypical version. And so I was researching that in order to best care for him and to understand him. And as I did, I, well, I don't need to tell you the whole story about how I came to that diagnosis, but it's very clear to me now that I have the diagnosis that in fact, yes, I have the combined uh, type of ADHD very much on the inattentive scale. And uh, I have also tipped into the hyperactive as well. And that was that was the surprise for me. So I'm still getting used to thinking of myself as neurodivergent. It wasn't something that I'd, I'd ever considered. I do have a child with dyslexia and he was diagnosed uh, when he was in grade three and I've I had to push for that diagnosis. He's now in year 11. And it's not a surprise to me that he has dyslexia. I can see that perhaps it's through me that he he got that. Although I'm I don't I'm not dyslexic, but I, there are elements that I can really relate to um, in him. And now I've forgotten the quest. The 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 first part of the question. Oh, it's about sleep, wasn't it? Um, well, now, as neurodivergent. Um, business owners, we can manage our mental health and you prioritising your sleep was one of those ways. Mm. Um, my three teenage boys, I'm a, I'm a single mum, three teenage boys, and I do have a partner who lives around the corner and he's got three three kids as well. Um, as the children have got older, it's been harder to, to prioritise my sleep because they stay up later than me but really in an ideal world I'd go to bed at 9 30 and wake up at you know six that that is what would suit my body best but their world does not operate in that way so COVID was a really uh, beautiful thing the lockdown to happen to me because suddenly I wasn't running around to endless basketball games in the middle of the night driving all over Victoria I started getting proper sleeps and Although there were, excuse me, other stresses, this it, it I suddenly started operating with more capacity than I'd had for very many years. So I've had to let go of a lot of things in order to put myself to bed early. You know, let go of perhaps not being as social as I'd like to be. Although I do consider myself to be an introvert, um, which means that I get my energy being by myself I think this is why COVID was the lockdowns were quite helpful for me because I got a lot of that time um but a lot of socializing happens at night it's when you know the day is done and and so I remove myself from that to prioritize sleep I I exercise I'm not a I've never been a big exercise person but I choose to do that because it helps me sleep and it helps my mental health and the re- the thing that really supports my mental health is I've called it stare at the wall time but non- another thing that I do is what I call buffer buffering and I buffer my diary so if I am giving a lecture at university say and that's a two-hour thing I will not see other students on an on a one-to-one capacity after that because I'll be no good to them and then I'll be an absolute mess the next day it'll take me a whole day of recovery so I buffer my diary with half hour an hour um I've got them grayed out as meetings but for me it's regrouping and and recovering and when I do that I sleep better as well so I have let go of being so vigilant about what time my kids go to sleep like they, they used to be very hyper vigilant around that 
but I trust them and we've built trust relationships there. So I um I just try and eat well as well. Like just the, the things that anyone's gonna tell you, it's it feels boring, but I feel so much better. Well, it's the basic things in life, isn't it? That we're told. Mm. And uh, you know, it's I think for me, exercise is the hardest, having a toddler trying to fit that in now. It's um and I'm not a morning person. I really in an ideal world, 10 to 12 hours sleep would be perfect for me. Right. Yeah. Yeah. At least 10. And so um my one thing this year is I've got to get up at six if I want to exercise because otherwise I'm just I'm not gonna get it in the day. And um it is so important for for me setting the day really and setting my intentions and how to manage everything. Are there is there anything else? I mean, we could talk for hours on different aspects of business and as a new person that as a person that's just been newly diagnosed with um, ADHD. I'm sure there's lots of um, different areas we could unpack around being diagnosed as an adult. Um, but for now, is there anything from a business perspective? I mean, we could have another conversation about being diagnosed as an adult um, in later life. I mean, I was 27 and that was devastating for me. Um, I think if I was diagnosed now, it would I'd feel much different to when I was 27. Um, but from a work perspective, is there anything around um, ADHD or being in business that you think would be helpful for our listeners? You've touched on some great points already. Um, yes, definitely. Um, one thing that I just wanted to touch on for myself about ADHD, the thing that I really related two, which was the impetus for me to go and uh, seek a diagnosis, was this idea of camouflaging and masking. And I just thought that I was a super organised person. I thought that I was the A-type personality. I was the I was the person that if you want something done, you go and ask Katie because she gets stuff done. And I was doing an enormous amount. And I thought that was just because I was really organized and that's who I was at my core but as it turns out that was all masking and I didn't understand how exhausting that was so I was noticing that in the mornings for example I thought I was a morning person so I would get up and do my things but what I found was that my brain was best in the morning and I had this almost, I guess, three-hour, four-hour window. And I would feel like I, I had to fit my exercise into that window or it wouldn't get done, that I needed to get my children out of the door and support them in that way and connect. If I wanted to do any composing, that was the time to do it because I, I've never composed at night. I know a lot of people do um, and they compose because it's nice and quiet and they can have that time to themselves. But I've always been useless from about 5 p.m. Uh and then I've, and but also to to do my job. And so I was finding that I was doing a 24 hour thing in four hours and then at 11 o'clock hitting the wall and then it gradually becoming less and less productive as time went by and then just pushing. And what I've discovered is that that was masking, that was being the good girl, doing all of the things so that I could, I don't know, be accepted be acceptable in my in my workplace. I noticed that as I've given up hypervigilance, I've become less organised and things are dropping away. And as uh, I'm 51 and and with um, perimenopause and menopause on its way, that sort of that exacerbated everything. So that was also part of my story. So I thought that I was a morning person, but actually now I'm finding that doing my exercise in the afternoon is better for me. I'm finding that I can walk through, if I I have to, I still want to go into my, hyper, uh, what are we calling it, hypervigilant sort of um, notions of being super organised. But if I don't have my discs there, nothing happens. And I didn't know that. So I'd set up all of these coping mechanisms, such as writing little songs to help me remember my lists, because in case I didn't have my list with me, I could remember the tune because I couldn't remember the words. 
um, or the, the activities. So as I've learned more about who I really am rather than who I thought I was, I've been able to adjust my business to suit me. So I can give you an example, and, and this is something that I'd encourage your listeners to think about, particularly if they're starting businesses, is that we, because they're our businesses, we get to choose how they run. And if we know ourselves and, and how we best work, we can find ways to implement the best working practices for us rather than what we see other people do in their businesses. And one example is with my mentoring, I like to be available to my artists across the month in between our one-to-one sessions so that we can keep the threads of conversation going. We work on their artistic practices, but really their lives in real time. But I really hate the telephone and I really spend enough time on Zoom, so I didn't want to sort of be nailed down and trapped into more Zoom time or live telephone uh, time in order to support them. So I've been using an app called Voxer, which is like a walkie-talkie app, and they can leave me messages whenever they like, and I put it on aeroplane mode at night. And in the mornings now when I do go for a walk, I will listen to the messages and then I'm able to respond in my own time or perhaps I, I, I'm quite a deep processor too, so sometimes I need a day or two to really think about my answer. And then on my walk I can give my answer while I'm doing something else that I value and I'm, I've got a beautiful creek near my house so I walk along the creek and I'm running my business as I'm going for my walk having time to myself. And that works. If I was stuck on Zoom or committing to another phone call in the day, I'd find that really disruptive to my own flow of the other things that I have going. So I guess I would say, write down what you know about yourself and try and design your business practices to suit you because there is so much more flexibility than what we think we have. I think we we often want to compare and look at what other people are doing in their business. And it sounds really sensible, but it may not work for our particular brain or our particular body or our particular body clock. And I think when we get those things right, then that's a whole lot of um, capacity that you're not using up just because uh, it doesn't happen to suit you. That is such an important message. And thank you so much for finishing up on that topic and the topic of masking. I mean, we could have a whole other podcast because it's uh, definitely a skill set that dyslexics have in uh, masking their difficulties. But um, I think, you know, your your thoughts around using an app where you can listen and then sit on it, I mean, that's a great way to multitask your time but in a, in a functional way that works for you. And um, I'm going to look at that app. I have heard of it before, but now you've spoken about it and I think it will be really valuable for our listeners to have a tool to uh, go and have a look at as well. So I would love to have you on the show again, Katie. Katie saw my very disorganised start to the morning and um, I don't have lists and maybe I should, uh, but they're all in my stored in my brain, my lists. Um, but thank you so much for coming on the show. It's just been such a privilege to talk to you and to listen about your journey and your businesses. And it would be great again to have another conversation around um, managing ADHD once you've been diagnosed uh, later in life. So thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me, Shay. It's been wonderful. Thanks so much for joining us today. I really hope you had as much fun as I did talking to Katie, but also learning so much more about her work and the importance of coaching and mentoring. If you'd like to find out more about The Artist Mentor, head to rethinkdyslexia.com. And don't forget, if you're thinking of starting a business or you're already on your business journey, please reach out to me and see how I can help you. You can contact me at hello, rethinkdyslexia.com.au. Thanks again for joining and for listening. Bye for now. Uh.